So welcome everybody to the first uh, uh, first occurrence of, uh, of the, the logic and philosophy uh, seminar of this year. So we used to focus uh, last year on the topics of the Big Miss project, but given that it's finished, uh, we extend a little bit uh, the, the, the seminar. Um, and I'll be doing it on my own because uh, Pilar found a better job. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, nevertheless, we have some, uh, some very interesting speakers coming up. Uh, for today, our original choice uh, are cancelled, uh, but uh, the replacement is at least as uh, exciting. Uh, so uh, it's been four months now that you don't work here anymore. So yes, it was about time, time to, to check up on, uh, on what we've <laughs> <you> been doing. <laughs> and, uh, so the floor is yours, Pierre. Thank you very much. So um, <coughs> this is something I was I, I would have I would have worked on if I hadn't joined Peter's project two years ago. So now that the project is over, I can go back to uh, to that paper who's been uh, in the in the in the process of being written for for some years now, and I I'm still happy to get some feedback on those ideas because they are uh, quite unorthodox, as you will see. So our topic is really counterpossibles. So let me just introduce the topic. So counterpossibles are counterfactuals with absolutely impossible antecedents. So the, the classic example that you find everywhere in the literature is the following. Is Hob if Hobbes had, had squared the circle, the sick children in the mountains of South America would not have cared at the time. <laughs> so you're supposed to know that it's impossible to square the circle. And it, it seems to be something like reasonable to say. Well, the sick, the sick children in the mountains of South America don't care about math, and they probably don't know who Hobbes is, even if they cared about math. So th there's no way this could not be true. Uh, so th those are counterpoints. Um, so, as you probably know, uh, possible word uh, semantics made it possible to do a logic for, for counterfactuals, and uh, the classic papers were done. At, uh, the classic paper is Stonecker, 1968, and then Lewis wrote the, wrote the book Counterfactuals in 73, which develops the possible word semantics uh, for counterfactuals, and those early uh, and foundational uh, theories. Um, built in the logic of counterfactuals that counterpossibles are vacuously true. Which means that they are all true and they are vacuously true in the same sense that universal quantifications on empty predicates are vacuously true. So if you remember your class of first order logic, probably remember I've been surprised because it's something that's not uh, totally in line with uh, natural language and with ancient logic. But if you if you take like an empty predicate like round square, so you granted the premise that there are no round, round squares, then it's, it's true to say that all the round squares are blank, whatever. So all round squares are bananas. So this is true to say all round all round squares are bananas just because there are no round squares. And this is the case of vacuous truth. This is true vacuously just because there's nothing there, so vacuously everything that is F is G for any G. And you have the same phenomenon with, uh, with uh, counterpossibles in the, in, the, in the original possible world theory. And there is actually a, a deep reason for that, is that like in the hidden semantics, you have universal quantification. And an impossibility is true at no possible goals. So the reasons are exactly the same, even though they don't show up when you look on this superficially at the formula. But if I were to give the semantic clause that is responsible for this, you will see a universal uh, quantifier and an empty uh, predicate. But for exactly the same reason, you are allowed to say uh, in Lewis and Stoliger's theory that if 2 plus 2 were equal to 5, then Emmanuel Macron would be a Trotskyist. So this is true. 
I took that example because I find it funny, but you can replace it with every, every, every sentence, whatever you can. This will be true according to the theme. And this is like the orthodox view, and, and Lewis like, uh, is, uh, notices that his theory has this result, and he argues that this is a good, good result. Uh, nowadays, there are people who uh, are completely uh, aware of this, and they don't take it just as, a, as, a, as something that we have to live with. They argue that it's like, uh, something that should be the case. And especially Williamson is one of the uh, foremost contemporary defenders of orthodoxy on this point. So the view that all counterpoint symbols are vacuously true is called vacuism, and this is the orthodox so This is orthodox vacuism. And we are philosophers, so each time there's something that is orthodox, there are obviously people <laughs> who reject it. Uh, so we are called, we're gonna call them the reformists. And the reformist view is like, no, Counterpossibles should be. Sh we should grant the possibility for counterpossibles to be false. They have the right to be false, just like any other counter counter counterfactor. We should not discriminate against them. So this is like the reformists. <coughs> so they want to get rid of vacuism. Uh, they have no problem with saying that uh, counterpossibles can be true, and they can be true also for good reasons, not just because. Uh, there are no possible words in which the antecedent uh, is true, so they can be non vacuous and true, and they want them to have the possibility to be false. I gave just two examples. This is a growing literature, uh, especially people from the relevance logic uh, camp have uh, defended, defended a view like that uh, about uh, counterfactuals. So, uh, Ed Nairs, in particular, is one of the early defenders of actually. Uh, non-vacuous reformism, and I, sh I think that the example of Hobbes comes from his paper. I'm not sure about that, but uh, anyway. So th basically, so this is the controversy I'm interested in. And, and the way I introduce it is a controversy that is just about a very narrow topic in the logic of counterfactuals. But in fact, and that's uh, what I hope uh, will be interesting to all those of you who are not logicians, actually this Debate has a lot of ramific ramifications with more general issues that have to do with metaphysics. Um, and especially the, the possibility to have hyperintentional notions in metaphysics. So, if you don't know what hyperintentionality is, I will explain in a while. But I want to explore uh, the connections between um, vacuism, hyperintentionality in, in metaphysics, just to give a preview. Uh, if you believe that there is hyperintentionality in metaphysics, then you should go with the reform. So that's one way that it connects. But the problem is that the way the reform has been carried out, especially by the two uh, co-authors, uh, the two authors, I mean the two group of authors I mentioned uh, <coughs> in the previous slide, it doesn't really work. At least I think there's a, there's a, there are problems of coherence. And so I will address that problem starting with uh, an argument from Williamson that is against the reform, and then I will give my solution uh, for, much, for more transparency in the reform, but this is, okay, this is a bug, because the, issue, the, the problem has to do with the notion of opacity. Uh, now I understand that uh, this preview is a bit opaque, but anyway, you've seen the, um, I introduced the topic, uh, so the next step is to give the main arguments for the reform, give some arguments for orthodoxy, explain how it's connected to meta metaphysics. Uh, William so who is a, he's a, an orthodox guy, he has a, a strong, I think, one, a very strong argument against vacuumism. So we'll explain that argument. I will see how the available reformist. Uh, I have replies that are not good replies, and then I will give one reply, which introduces more transparency. So that's that's where I'm going. Uh, so why be a reformist? And uh, the, so the first thing that some reformists say is that well, actually, common sense is uh, is non-vacuist, and basically it just appeal to intuitions. 
So some counterpassable sound intuitively non vacuously true. Some counterpassable sounds sound intuitively non vacuously false. Therefore, vacuism is false. And just like they give like examples of pairs of um, of counterpassables, the, fir the first of which sounds true for like good reason, non vacuous reasons, and the second sounds false for non vacuous reasons. So the first 4A is the one I gave earlier. So for B, it just negate the consequent. If Hobbes had squared the circle at the time, uh, or you just unnegate, sorry, the, the consequence. If Hobbes had squared the circle, six children in the mountains of South America would have cared at the time. No. If they didn't know who Hobbes was, anyways, he could not possibly have cared. Another example, which actually would be central to the uh, to the to the, to the, to the, to the the second part of the talk uh, is the following. If Hesperus had not been phosphorus, uh, the astronomical facts would have been different from what they, are, they actually are. Or a variant of this example is if, if Hesperus had not been phosphorus, uh, my astronomy teacher would have been a liar. Because, well, he told me that they are in fact the same, the same planet. And they are identical to humans. However, if you say if Hesperus had not been Hesperus, the astronomical facts would have been different. It seems like not the right thing to say, because the fact that Hesperus is Hesperus is identical to itself. It's not an astronomic fact. It's a either a logical fact or maybe a metaphysical fact. It has nothing to do with astronomy. So it seems strange to say something like that. Uh, so the variant is if Hesperus has not been Hesperus. My astronomy teacher would have been a liar. No, your logic teacher would have been a liar, or your metaphysics teacher would have been a liar. So, so this is a this is pretty standard uh, methodology in uh, contemporary uh, analytic philosophy. You just give intuitions, uh, and uh, well, <coughs> to the extent that they are shared. The problem with those cases is that they, like the the counterpossibles are not ordinary counterfactuals, so we have to to uh, take far-fetched examples, so sometimes the intuitions are not so clear. But at least uh, I'm just like reporting uh, what uh, reformists say. They say, well, this is intuitive. And, uh, and saying that B for B is true <coughs> and find B is true seems like counterintuitive. Problem is that intuitions are, they are not like, a, they don't give you like a knockdown argument. They are, they are like, a, prima facie justified, but they are as good as, uh, uh, as it gets insofar as we don't have a good, ex like an independently, well, let me put it this way. Uh, they give prima facie evidence, but of course they can be overridden if we have an independently plausible error theory. And this will be a topic for something that will come up later. So if, if, I, if I know things about uh, human psychology, which says that there are, we use heuristics when it's just those things that uh, make those judgments, those judgments particularly uh, unreliable, then I have a good reason to uh, not trust this particular intuition. It doesn't mean that I don't have to, 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 I have to be skeptical about intuitions in general, but for this particular kind of intuition that is independently explained by plausible error theory, I'm justified in not, in not taking that, uh, that, just, that intuition into account. So that's the kind of way the, the, the dialectics can go from there. But for now, I would just, for now, I would just accept those intuitions uh, as they are. Uh, now, uh, what, should the, what can the orthodox philosopher or logician say in response to that? Of course, the kind of thing that he or she will have to say is to counterbalance the intuitions with, with more general theoretical demands. And so this is like an argument that is given by Williamson, which says that the, the orthodox logic is actually much more elegant, much more unified than the logic you get if you want to account for uh, the, the intuitions that I gave earlier. So in the, in the um, 
Those principles are a principle that hold in most versions of the political semantics of um, Starker and Lewis. So Starker and Lewis don't agree on exactly the same system. They disagree about some details. But those are really fundamental principles that hold that hold that for both of their of their theories, and they are intimately connected uh, to the fact that we use possible worlds to model uh, uh, the logic. So basically, this says that when two sentences are logically equivalent, they can be exchanged in antecedent position. Uh, we say that if we have an internal, the logical internal into the NB, we can take A as a counterfactual superstition, we we'll always get B. Uh, this say that if you uh, if the conjunction of all the B, all the B ends until B, uh, if we take the same, uh, if you have a <coughs> part of the supposition that entails B1, B2 until the end, then that counterfactual supposition will be B. And have another principle that is a uh, principle of substitutivity of identity, which will be important for later. Says that if we have a, a true counterfactual and A is identical to B, uh, then if we substitute B for A in the original uh, counterfactual, we'll also get a true counterfactual. Um, so of course, if you want to if you want to defend the if you want to to have a logic that does not that allows for the, the judgments I gave earlier. So if you want the, in the, the two pairs I gave earlier, the possibility for the first one to be true and the second one to be false, you will have to remove those principles. Uh, I cannot like show ex exactly the demonstration, but they will, you will have to make sure that they do not hold. You would need a weaker logic. But of course, the problem is that they will fail only for counter possibles. You still want them to hold for ordinary counterfactuals where the antecedent is possible. So what you need is them to be false, but you need them to, to, be, to come back when you put uh, uh, the possibility of the antecedent as a premise. And then, like Williamson says, yeah, well, this is, uh, this is ugly, basically. Ceteris uh, paribus, a uniform counterfactual logic should be preferred to a non-uniform counterfactual logic. Vacuous counterfactual logic is more uniform than non vacuous counterfactual logic, therefore, vacuism should be preferred to non vacuism. I'm sure there's a way, I, 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 if I remember correctly, Williamson puts it in more subtle terms, but like the, this is the general message. Uh, this is not the, where I'm going to uh, like disagree or attack him. Uh, the only point I would like to say is that it's not like a completely decisive argument because you have similar phenomena within like the uh, the usual, the usual semantics. There are some principles that fail only when the antecedent is impossible. Uh, so for example, this particular behavior of negation uh, fails uh, when the antecedent uh, is not possible, but when the antecedent is possible. So you have a similar like, uh, uh, phenomenon already in the in total semantics. Just to say that this, this argument is not a knockdown argument, and perhaps it's not completely coherent, but still, I think you can see that those very, uh, those kind of uh, laws, they, I think it's before anyone thinks about counter possibles, they, 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 they seem like intuitively plausible. So if A logically entails B, and it seems like a fortiori, if it were to be the case at A, then it would have to be the case at B. It seems like very intuitive, a very intuitive, intuitive things to say. But this already is enough to get you into a vacuumism very quickly. Um, yes? Yeah, you mean here that it's not consequences, right? Each rule doesn't work, not the not, uh, NV dash plane. Yes, it's not thank you very much. Yeah, no, no, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. So, uh, I sh yeah, no, that's a very good, uh, that's a very good, um, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, the notation is misleading. <laughs> So just wanted to make sure. Now, what I should have done is like to, to yeah, yeah, that's to what I mean. The inference slide. So what I what 
what, I, what, what I meant, what this is supposed to mean is that it is logically possible to have this true and this false. Okay. But thanks, yeah, that's, that's just a sloppy way of putting it. In some cases, there is no problem. Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's not that whenever <laughs> this is a. Uh, yeah. Thanks, that's uh, an important uh, thing for uh, the written version. Okay, now I, I go for the more interesting stuff, uh, which is the connection with metaphysics. Um, so there is a, an obvious connection, it's something that, uh, that is also pointed out by Williamson. Um, so there is a, a certain kind of use of, for, in general, for uh, counterfactuals within fictionalist research programs. Um, so, for example, uh, if, you have, if, if, if you want to, to, to be a fictionalist about something, you still have the, the problem of explaining how you can use that useful fiction to actually do some work. So here are a few examples. Uh, for example, uh, you're a nominalist, you believe that numbers don't exist and you certainly don't want to quantify our numbers or our any mathematical entities. But still, it might be useful to, uh, to use uh, numbers as a useful fiction, for example, when you want to do like, mathematical calculations when you do physics. But if you, if you are a hardcore physicalist, you believe, no, there are no abstract objects, there are no numbers. So similarly, you can, uh, you can be at, at core like an activist, you, only, you believe that only the actual world exists, so the all the reasons <coughs> that uh, uh, the possible world is just like uh, just a myth, but still you want to be able to use that myth when you want to reason about possibility. <laughs> so you can be a fiction this way. You could be like a hardcore biological nihilist, so you believe that nothing composes whatsoever, but still you want to be able to talk as as though there were composite things, and then you will take uh, marriageful theories uh, that accept composition principles as a useful fiction. But as I said, the uh, fiction is useful only insofar as it can back as it can back truth preserving inferences. When you want to be able to use that fiction to make actual inferences. And here uh, counterfactuals can be useful. So one way to use a fiction is say, well if the fiction were true, given that this is a truth that does not involve fiction, I can get Another truth that's not a fiction. So, for example, if you are a uh, mathematical platonist, uh, no, no, uh, a physicalist, and you want to use uh, math when you do your physical calcul calculation, and here you have um, like a physical description, uh, you have your fiction, which is mathematical platonism, and so if that were true, I would be able to quantify over numbers, make calculations, blah blah blah, and come up with another physical description. And I would have used math to learn something new about the physical world, even if I'm not committed to the existence of mathematical entities. So that's the way that like, a fictionalist program can be uh, put forward by using uh, counterfactuals. Uh, the problem is that uh, if you do that uh, in metaphysics, it's not automatic, but there's a high chance that the kind of fictions that you will be using will be uh, false, of course, because they are fictions, but they will be non-contingently false. They will be actually impossible. So, um, if uh, the world is a physical, is it, is it, is it, is it. if there are no abstract, abstract objects in the actual world, it's not because uh, the, our actual world is contingently devoid of abstract objects, because, well, abstract objects are incoherent entities or they just cannot possibly exist, so there, there is no like metaphysically possible worlds with abstract objects. So if I want to use uh, uh, my fiction in the antecedent of a, of, um, of a counterfactual, I better have a number to semantics, otherwise all the things I will do with those uh, fictionalist counterfactuals will be trivial, just by vacuism. 
So uh, this is one reason uh, from fictionalism to be interested into non-vacuist counterfactuals. Uh, you will need non-vacuist counterfactuals to do things like that. Of course, you, do, you don't have to be a fictionalist, but if you're interested in that kind of program, then you will need them. We? Yes? Uh, I, I'm not sure whether I get a program like and this is, that's why I interrupted. It seems quite crucial. Uh, so, if if um, like s suppose I don't believe in God or an intervening God or something, yeah. and I say um, somebody has done something evil, uh, and ha but had God existed, had a, a good intervening God existed, and this person would be punished. With that counterfactual, I'm, I'm able to conclude that that person will be punished. It doesn't seem right to conclude from person has done something evil to that person will be punished if I'm not a, if I'm an atheist, right? Yeah, that's, a good, uh, that's a good point. That sort of fallacy is all over the place, and this seems just a, a specific point where it gets extra bad. <laughs> Uh, maybe we can keep this for discussion. Eh? Mm. I thought I missed something. Oh, okay. Sure. No, no, no. That's a, that's a good. Um, that's a good. Uh, so I think the so the idea that uh, you can learn you c so using counterfactuals is a way. You know, putting fictions fictions in the in the antecedent of a counterfactual is a way to make to have them do work. So it's possible that the kind of like uh, schematization I gave is over simplistic and over generates. Uh, I have to confess I haven't like uh, thought hard about this. Um, but I think the the, the, the general idea that uh, the using counterfactuals to uh, reason with uh, fictions and fictionalized programs and putting them in the antecedent is something that is quite like natural, I think, to, uh, to assume. So perhaps it will have to be done in a, in a more uh, uh, cautious way. But can you agree at least with, the, with this idea that you will, you will need them in the, ante in the antecedent of a, of a counterfactual? In the case of fictionalism, yeah. yeah okay, good. then that's yeah. Still, the strategy seems so evenly flawed. But I don't want to run this too far afield, but I mean, yeah, the case of, the case of theism, I think, is actually really interesting because I got in a fight about exactly this in a graduate metaphysics seminar with Peter Van Inwagen once, mm. as a graduate student, who is a firm believer that S5 is just the true modal logic that describes the world. And so, if God exists, God exists necessarily. So if I believe that God doesn't exist, I can't reason counterfactually about God's existence. I don't have the tools, right? Yeah. He necessarily doesn't exist. He's not out there. So I can't even formulate. So there may be an actually kind of an interesting analogy case. You can, you can, you can if you if you go non vacuist Well, no, I know, but I mean, but he's, but I mean, yeah. So, but I just mean, there's, I think there's a cool. There may be an interesting analogy to push there actually. That could be kind of a cool example actually, because the theism example, it it, can, it generates the same kind of worry, but in a weird, in like a weird way. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, how does it relate to fictionalism? It seems to me that it's the same kind of, <coughs> oh, excuse me, if, if you'd like. I guess the idea is that if you're if you're a firm if you're a firm believer, maybe maybe this maybe the connection is never mind. Maybe the connection maybe actually is just a pure counter possible, now that I think about it. Um, the idea is if you're a firm if, if S5 has to be the real modal logic, then uh, for a lot of, for most theists, God's contentions is just a counter possible. So we're just back to having a counter possible in the end anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so well, this is one way to, to put uh, uh, non vacuism into the picture. I think this, uh, this has been explicitly a, a point of debate in the case of uh, model fictionalism. So in the discussion between Hale and Rosen, like at some point, Hale said, yes, but you know, the semantics of, con of, uh, of counterfactuals forces you to say something absurd or, and he assumes that vacuism is true. So if you go non-vacuous, you avoid <coughs> at least that part of the, so perhaps it's, 
from a purely dialectical point of view, it's perhaps better to stick with a specific case and not run, try to give her like a general schema that over generates. Anyway, another connection is with the uh, hypertensional metaphysics. So uh, I will have to introduce the notion of hypertensionality. So I try to give a, a definition which is as broad as possible uh, and not too sloppy. So I hope I kind of uh, arrive at something satisfactory. So like those uh, meter value walls are supposed to be like uh, neutral among like syntactic categories. So they can be whatever expressions that admit extensions. So if, you have, if they are like sentences, then this symbol of equivalence says like uh, materially equivalent. If they are singular terms, this means identity. Uh, this symbol is like a necessity operator. This is a symbol for a context. So it, is, it means basically a sentence with a hole in it that you can fill either with a sentence or with a singular term. So obviously you need to like be consistent. So if you decide to say that the, the meta variables are for individuals, then you take them as meta variables for individuals all the way. If you take them to be meta variables for sentences, you would like the same interpretation all the way. And so basically this what this rule allows you is to allow for substitution of things that are necessarily equivalent. So if two individuals are necessarily the same, and you say something true about the first one, then you can say something true just by replacing the name of the second <coughs> with the name of the first. Similarly, if you have two sentences that are necessarily equivalent, and you apply an operator to that sentence, you say, I believe that sentence, then you should be able to say that you have to believe the other one. So this is a substitutivity of necessarily equivalent. SME. So the context C is hypertensional if this rule fails. So there are contexts that do not, do not allow the substitutivity of necessarily equivalence. And we are all familiar with hypertensional contexts. Uh, belief or Alice believes that is a hypertensional context. Um, so in order to show that something is hypertensional, you need to have those three pieces of information. Uh, have two sentences that are necessarily equivalent. <coughs> have a context uh, that applies truly to the first one. And the context. And the same context does not apply truly to the second one. So here, Alice believes that, that Alice believes that Bob is stupid. Let's assume it's true. Uh, suppose that Alice doesn't know anything about Derrida. It seems like false to conclude that Alice believes that God is stupid and either Derrida is smart or Derrida is not smart. But, like, God is stupid and God is stupid and either Derrida is smart or Derrida is not smart are true in exactly the same possible words, so they are necessarily equivalent. So we have an instance of this case. It's actually very easy to generate uh, uh, instances like this just by using irrelevant um, tautologies or irrelevant antilogies. And this is a, so it's very easy to devise tests for hypertensionality like that. It's more complicated to find like plausible contexts where this would be meaningful, but uh, here I suppose it, it's okay. The thing, so, since uh, like an important paper for, uh, of Nolan in 2014, there is a growing number of uh, philosophers who accept that many metaphysical concepts generate hyperintentional concepts. So when you talk about essence, when you talk about dispositions, when you talk about grounding, when you talk about dependence, when you talk about fundamentality, you will use context in the, in the sense I introduced above, which is uh, like forms of expression that can be filled. Like for example, it is essential to so create is that. This is a sentential context generated by the concept of essence. So you end up with a context that behave like, like that, uh, that are hyperintentional. And I gave uh, classic examples uh, 
from uh, the literature on essence. So the example actually goes back to fine, but I think it's already in, a, in, a, in an earlier paper by Mike Donald. Anyway, so it's essential to Socrates that Socrates is human. It seems like something everyone is prepared to agree with. But it's not essential to Socrates that uh, the, sing the, the singleton set that contains only Socrates exists. This is something that is necessary given that Socrates exists, but it's not part of Socrates' nature to be a member of that particular set. But it's just something that goes necessary with his existence, but it's not part of his nature, it's not part of the definition of Socrates. Uh, so that's why uh, people tend to deny me. So it's a very Aristotelian or neo Aristotelian uh, intuition, but all the readers of Fine uh, have accepted that, so I. I mean, I can see the intuition to the other stuff. It doesn't follow your scheme, right? For that, it should be necessarily equivalent that Socrates is human and that singleton Socrates exists. Uh, um, um, with this yeah, so right. I think it has to do with, um, with whether you want to assume that um, Socrates uh, has to. Um, whether you assume like that predication requires existence or something like that. Because um, Socrates is human in all the possible worlds where Socrates exists. And singleton Socrates exists in all the possible worlds where uh, Socrates exists. Oh, it's necessary that Socrates is human. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Socrates. Yeah. So uh, the question is whether there's a, if you take a whether Socrates can be human in the world where it does not exist. So in that case, uh, well, that world would be a world where Socrates is human, but... No, but if it's necessary, that's fine. I was thinking that it could Yeah, the, the assumption is that like a, a, essential properties are yeah. necessary, but what is like uh, debated, what is denied implicitly here, is that all necessary properties are essential. Only a subset of your essential your necessary properties are essential to you, but all your essential properties are unnecessary. Mm. Yeah. So there's another example given by, uh, I don't remember who gave it first, but it's, it's definitely in the paper of Nolans. So suppose you, uh, you, uh, you write a, pr a computer program, uh, you're a teacher in a, you're teaching Godel's in computer theorems, and you write a, we well, call a program that recursively generates all the theorems of the systems you're studying. So of course it would take infinite time to speed up all the theorems, but you put a line of code that says, well, if you ever uh, generate the Gödel sentence, then you print, I have proved my own Gödel sentence. And of course we know that this will never, this cannot possibly happen for mathematical reasons, which are basically the uh, first uh, incompleteness theorem Gödel, but you can still, like, if you want, you can still, like, if you have one line of code to, to produce, you can, you can add that, and then in that in that scenario, uh, you can say, well, the program is supposed to print. I have proved I have proved my own Gödel sentence in the event that the program proves uh, the Gödel sentence. Of course, this is like not possible because you know that it cannot happen, but this is something that is true to say. Uh, but uh, if you substitute the impossibility, the impossible intestinal with another impossible intestinal that has nothing to do, like the program is supposed to print, I have proved my own Gödel sentence in the event that the data is the laws, which is uh, absolutely impossible given some assumptions about proper names and necessity. And I don't think we're into it. If you, if you agree that it's impossible for Derrida to be Deleuze given that there are two different people, then this is also counter-possible, and the antecedent of both are true in the same set of possible world, namely the anti set. So this is uh, evidence that uh, this uh, counter-possible context, at least, is hyper-intentional. And in, in this case, it's supposed to show that these positions, concepts, uh, are hyperintentional. So we have hyperintentionality, and what is 
important about hyperintentionality is that unlike uh, the hyperintentionality of belief, uh, it's something that's supposed to have like a worldly source. So when you, when we uh, so one way to account for the fact that uh, it can be Alice can believe that Bob is stupid without believing that Bob is, Bob is stupid and either Derrida is smart or Derrida is smart is that belief is something that introduces the perspective of an agent. So you can think of uh, possibility that Bob is stupid without thinking about Derrida, even though that possibility is intuitive, intuitively the same as this one. Um, so you can abstract away information uh, when you are in the business of believing. That kind of explains why you can make some subtle differences between things that are like pieces of pieces of information that are true in exactly the same possible worlds. But it's hard to uh, to come up with such an explanation uh, when it comes to <coughs> metaphysical hypertension because here we don't care about we don't have the perspective of an agent. No one believes anything. We're not talking about uh, mental representations of anything. We're talking about what it is to be Socrates or what should happen. In that, in that, uh, in that particular uh, stimulus, even though it's impossible, uh, were to occur. Um, and actually, so some explicit, explicit connection has been made between uh, like people who are in the business of hyperintentional metaphysics and uh, counterpositals. So Alastair Wilson has a paper uh, where he actually. Uh, give a, uh, an interpretation of grounding that is based on uh, some work on the interventions counterfactuals. So basically, he sees a, like a connection between uh, uh, grounding claims and counterfactuals involving uh, impossible interventions. So it's a way to sell grounding to philosophers of science who understand the uh, intervention. So for example, if an intervention were to, to annihilate just singleton Socrates, uh, Socrates itself would not be an, an annihilated, I don't know if you pronounce that word. The idea is that singleton Socrates is an entity that is dependent on Socrates. So if you just surgically remove uh, the, the, the dependent entity, you don't touch the more fun fundamental entity. So that's how uh, an intervention annihilating singleton Socrates uh, keeps Socrates safe, safe, but it, it doesn't. Um, and of course, so if you, if you take just uh, negation of consequent, then you should have a false evaluation. Um, similarly, if you uh, assume that uh, just one of Socrates and Socrates, uh, uh Socrates were to exist, but not both, it seems that the one who should not exist is the less fundamental entity, which is similar to Socrates, whereas uh, it could not possibly be the case that uh, only single to Socrates exists without Socrates. Uh, it seems like uh, metaphysically completely uh, incoherent. Uh, so uh, here we have metaphysical hyperintention. And it's, and it's manifested by uh, non vacuous counterpossibles. And, and Alistair Wilson makes, the, 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 I think, the very perspicuous claim that observation that the kind of metaphysicians that are prone to accept grounding are the same kind of people who should uh, go into non vacuous counterpossibles, and the same logicians that are inimical to uh, non vacuous counterpossibles are the same who are skeptical of grounding. So the, the two kind of positions seem to be aligned. Uh, and if it turns out that uh, there's a way to translate every case of metaphysical hyperintentionality to a non vacuous counterfactual, uh, then you can see that the, the two things actually go very deeply together. And actually, so, so uh, there's a kind of like recipe. So I don't have like a, a formal proof that the recipe works because you would need to build assumptions about. Uh, contexts and also about the logic of, of, uh, of counterfactuals, so it's, it's, it's 
hard to make everything implicit, but at a, like a semi-intuitive level, I think uh, it's sort of easy to see how you can start from the information that the context is hypertensional to uh, generating uh, a pair of quantum possibles that shows that non-vacuism has to be true. So basically, you start with a so the pattern is that you have necessary covalence between the sentence that satisfies the context and the sentence that does not. And typically, you get that because this is completely irrelevant to the context. And so you can um, you can form a um, uh, uh, counter possible by having as a premise the sentence that satisfies the context conjoined with the negation of the necessary equivalent but irrelevant one. And I don't have the full proof that in general this counterfactual should be true, <coughs> but in all the examples I've seen, uh, this is typically the case. And of course if you negate the, the, the consequence, then you will get something false, and so it will be uh, further examples for uh, non vacuumism So here I've played that game of uh, expressing all the, the examples about fundamentality, about grounding, about essence, uh, by using that recipe or refined version of that recipe. Actually, this is not exactly uh, an instance of the thing I presented. Uh, you need to be some, some like um, simple uh, like uh, simplifications are are. Have been um, have been done to uh, to uh, to make it more readable. Uh, but the uh, the idea is that uh, such a translation is a uh, works. That there's a, there's a recipe that that seems to work easily, and actually that allows to generate those kind of like uh, examples in a, in a systematic way. Uh, so, the theoretical case for non-vacuumism, uh, if hypertensional met uh, metaphysical hypertensionalism is true, then metaphysical concepts generate hypertensional concepts. If metaphysical concepts generate hypertensional concepts, then there are non-vacuous counterpossibles. Therefore, metaphysical hypertensionalism entails non-vacuumism. So this is the kind of argument that takes you from metaphys metaphysical hypertensionalism to uh, non vacuumism Okay, so now, uh, how, uh, how could uh, the orthodox uh, resist uh, to, that, to that move? Uh, and here, uh, Williamson has a very, uh, what I found a very powerful argument from objectivity. Uh, this is not necessarily a very strong argument for uh, all kinds of uh, programs about uh, counterpossibles, but it's particularly strong for the kind of programs that tie non vacuumism to metaphysics because we want to be able to say that the, the counterfactuals are objective in, in those cases. Um, so the Williamson argument for orthodox goes as follows. It's my uh, like reconstruction that I, I, I think it's pretty compared to, uh, to uh, the way William Williamson presented. So counterfactual contexts are always objective. Uh, counterfactuals are about the way uh, things would go differently if things would be different. It's not about what we believe, how we believe they would change, uh, whatever, so it's objective. Um, so the second premise is that if vacuumism is false, then counterfactual contexts are referentially opaque. I'll show how each premise can be justified in a minute. For now, it's important to just get the, the structure of the argument. Third, referentially opaque context cannot be objective. Therefore, vacuism is, uh, is true. Uh, so of course, I need to define what is an opaque context, uh, and it will be done shortly. Now, I'll just talk about objectivity, because um, um, in the way Williamson understands it, it has a very something quite specific in mind. Uh, so the idea is that um, a context 
in general and the counterfactual context in, in particular is objective if um, filling it with something that makes it true has nothing to do with the way the perspective of an agent and the way represents anything to herself. So you can get an idea of that if you compare uh, counterfactuals with indicative conditionals, which are supposed to, to be dependent from the perspective of the asserter. So if an asteroid hits Hesperus, if an asteroid had hit Hesperus, it would have hit phosphorus. If you know that Hesperus is phosphorus, then it's something that you have to accept. They are just the same thing. So if you hit one under the first name, you hit the second under the second name. Um, and it remains true even if no one knows that Hesperus is phosphorus. But if you take the perspective of, um, of a pre-Babylonian astronomer who actually thinks that there are two distinct uh, stars, that it makes sense, it's completely coherent for that person to say that if Zeus uh, hits Hesperus tomorrow, he might still spur phosphorus. That's kind of like a reasonable thing to say. And it's not, something, it's not reasonable to say uh, from the same perspective, if Zeus hits Hesperus tomorrow, he might still sp spare Hesperus. This is, this is like nonsense. But here we have to change, like uh, um, we have to just change the uh, names of the same entities. Conclusion: uh, Indicative conditionals are representational; they are not objective constructions. Counterfactuals are objective constructions. And you have a similar. If you, if you want to 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 take that distinction from a. Uh, more familiar ground, so if you understand the difference between objective probability and subjective probability, you have the same thing. So if you understand probability in an objective way, the probability that A hits Hesperus, given some background condition, should be the same. Sorry, I forget about the zero there. It has to be, uh, I, I forgot uh, to deal with that. I had a different example in my mind. So the, prob <laughs> the probability that a hits Hesperus is the same as the probability that A hits phosphorus, given the same background conditions. But if you talk about tendencies, then one is consistent to have one like higher than the other, because an agent may not may ignore that Hesperus is phosphorus. So the sense in which I talk about objective and subjective uh, construction is exactly the same in which we think of uh, probability as objective and subjective. Now I turn to opacity. So uh, opacity in the in the sense of referen referential opacity, is basically the failure of the rule of substitutivity of identity. So the rule says that if A is identical to B and A satisfies the context C, then I can replace A with B within the context C. Uh, and when uh, context uh, always satisfies this rule, we say that the context is refer referentially transparent. And we say that it's referentially opaque when uh, there are counterexamples to this rule. To this rule. And so for example, it's very well known that knowledge uh, generates uh, a referentially opaque context. Uh, but pre babylonian and astronomers knew that Hesperus is identical to Hesperus. Yes. <laughs> but they didn't know uh, that Hesperus is identical to Phosphorus. And I just like, and of course we know that it's true that Hesperus is Phosphorus. So this is an example of the failure of uh, the substitutivity identity for uh, um, epistemic context, context of knowledge. So why should we say that opaque, uh, that if vacuumism is true, Premise 2 said if vacuumism is true, sorry, if, vac if non-vacuumism is true, if vacuumism is false, then counterpossibles are opaque. Well, when I gave the intuitions that uh, the, the, the reformers uh, uh, accept uh, in favor of non-vacuumism, I just gave an instance that actually violates the substitutivity of identity. Uh, if Hesperus had not been phosphorus, the astronomical facts would have been different. If Hesperus had not been Hesperus, the astronomical facts would have been different. So if you say this is a good reason to be uh, non-vacuumist, you also have to say this is a good reason to believe that counterpossibles are opaque. And this is kind of a. Uh, and Williamson does not. I mean, this is an example that is given and accepted by referees. So, uh, 
it's not like a trick from Williamson or something. Yeah, it's it's over there in the literature and and repeatedly uh, like um, reformers have stuck to that kind of intuition. So it seems like you have nothing else to say than well, it's op referentially opaque. And then uh, you have the third premise which says well, a referentially opaque context has to be representational. And here. Also, it seems very like uh, very hard to avoid. So, uh, if a context is really about an object itself, independently of the rate presented by any agent, either implicitly mentioned or uh, explicitly mentioned in the context, then if you replace the name the name of A with uh, another name of the same entity, then it has to uh, it has to be uh, uh, the context with that name. Replaced should also be true. There's no way you can move to, from truth to falsity if the context is objective. So, uh, actually, and actually, Williamson used the um, referential opacity as a test for being subjective, for uh, for not being objective, for being representational. So, it seems like there's no no coherent sense to be made of the possibility that the context be both um, uh, objective. And opaque. Uh, see, the mark of objective context is that uh, substitutivity of identity preserves truth within them. Uh, so it looks like the the uh, copy paste error. <laughs> and I just didn't copy paste the same version of the argument. But so we have support for the, for the three premises. And the conclusion like logically follows from the three premises, so it looks like it's very hard to uh, to accept all the premises and uh, deny the conclusion. So that's why I think this argument is a very good argument, very strong argument for for the T. So what have the reformists? How how do they propose to solve the issue? And here, what is interesting is that they don't agree about how to react to that. Uh, some people say uh, we need to deny one. So we need to we need to grant that counter possibles are not objective, and actually others say that we don't have to do that. We can live with uh, objective counter possibles and non vacuumism. This is what Berto and colleagues did in 2017, and I'm going to uh, to disagree with both of them. Uh, so, uh, should we should we accept opaque uh, counter possibles? That is, one option is to say they are opaque and they are uh, representational; they are not objective. You can make coherent sense and block the argument. The question is whether it it is a good move. Uh, so, my first uh, observation: it's not exactly something against the view, but it's definitely uh, a criticism of the way people argue for that view in the literature. Uh, so actually they, like some arguments that you find repeatedly in the literature are based on a fallacy. Uh, it pains me to say that because those are very, <laughs> very good philosophers and colleagues that I appreciate the work very much. But when I think hard about this, I come to the conclusion that there's a fallacy involved, so I have to, I have to say it. So one common argument is, and I give a course, of course, so one, People go like this, non vacuous counter possibles are hyper intentional. Hyper intentional contexts are referentially opaque. Yes, that's what they say. Therefore, non vacuous counter possibles are referentially opaque. And this is not quite right. So, there is a connection between non vacuism and hyper intentionality. So, it's possible to go from very minimal assumptions about counterfactual logic and modal logic to the view that if you accept non vacuism, then it generates a hyper intentional context. So this is like formal proof, in this case. Uh, I, mean, I, I have some uh, steps that I'm not completely, uh, some calculations that I avoided because when, I want, when I'm interested in the structure of the argument, we can go into the details if you want, if you're not convinced to make sure any. But this is, this is uncontroversial. Non vacuumism gets you directly to hyper intentionality. 
the question is how hypersonality relates to opacity. Better, and, and so this is something that so better like say something referencing Williamson, but he says something stronger than Williamson says. Williamson says, hey, the people who argue for non quantum principles on the basis of examples use examples that also show uh, that they are um, uh, opaque. So this, you can take that as an, an ad hominem point. It says, well, if you accept this intuition, you also have to accept the, um, the, the view that they are opaque. But it doesn't imply that because they are non-vacuous, they have to be opaque. It's just like a coincidence. Um, and so when that says it has been argued that non-vacuous quantum principles, if there are any, must be referentially opaque. No, it doesn't follow from uh, what Williamson says, and even the way it, it, it presented the evidence. Uh, and so, uh, and then she moves uh, directly from hyperintentionality to uh, um, to uh, opacity. Impossible disposition would have to be indicated hyperintentionally. One and the same object might be disposed in some way to possess So this is a point about hyperintentionality, and I agree. But hyperintentionality does not. This is a, a symptom of opacity. I don't know what those two points are supposed to mean, but it cannot mean that concept. So we have to be careful here because that's very important. Robert and Salerno uh, make the same move. The non vacuous counterfactual is hyperintentional. Hyperintentional operators do not permit substitution of coreferential terms are very Why? It's not in, it doesn't follow from the definition of uh, hyperintentional operators. Even though there are some cases where you can establish both by the same example, but it doesn't mean that every example that shows uh, uh, hyperintentionality also shows capacity. And actually, there are good examples of, uh, so, sorry. So there are arguments, so you can move in the other direction. You can move from opacity to hyperintentionality. And that's the reason why some examples, you can find examples that show both at the same time. Because if you show opacity, then automatically show hyperintentionality. If you accept Kripke's doctrine about the necessity of identity. Uh, so if an identity between two rigid designators is necessary if true, and you have evidence for opacity based on the fact that A equals B, A satisfies C but does not satisfy uh, A, satisfy, but B does not satisfy C, then by the necessity of identity, you can strike it to, to, uh, to a necessity, and then you have evidence for hyperintentionality. Uh, so from opacity, you can go to hyperintentionality, but the other way around, no. And there are there are very simple counterexamples: uh, factual equivalence. So the uh, the fact that two sentences describe the same fact, uh, possibly described in different ways, would behave hyperintentionally because facts are individuated hyperintentionally. But it will be referentially transparent because the factual, the factual descriptions are meant to be referentially transparent. Uh, so Socrates, Socrates exists. Uh, it's trivially, uh, factually equivalent with Socrates exists. But Socrates exists, not factually equivalent with singleton Socrates exists. They do not, they do not describe the same fact. Hesper's shines is uh, factually this trivially factually uh, equivalent with Hesper's shines, but it is also uh, uh, factually equivalent with Fortford shines. So the, mm -hmm. actually the factual uh, equivalence is refreshing transparent. It's not just an accident, it's just because, well, just because Hesperus is phosphorus, so we are allowed to make that difference. So, uh, so this, this, so the, if you if you thought that you could get uh, opaque counterpossibles just because they believe they believe hyperintentionality, just because they believe hyperintentionally, <coughs> that's definitely not a good reason. Um, uh, so uh, so that's one point. So I think and, and most of the reasons I've, I've seen in literature are like that. Another problem with that is the. Um, is the kind of situation you end up with. So what you end up with if you, if, if you, uh, 
if you just take the intuition at, this, uh, at face value, is that uh, ordinary counterfactuals are objective because typically uh, they behave transparently. But then it turns out that some counterpossibles uh, behave, uh, behave in, a, in an opaque way. And, and here we have a, like an explanatory challenge to explain why should the, the model status of the antecedent have anything to do with opacity or transparency. It looks like uh, we don't see the reason why we should move from transparent to opaque just when we uh, start when we introduce new possibility in the antecedent. Uh, so this is not a knockdown argument, but I think uh, this is a very unstable, unstable position. Uh, um, and also, more importantly for the, for the case, if, if you believe, if, if you resist Williamson argument by saying that uh, counter possibles uh, are not always objective, then uh, it doesn't sit very well with the with the, the, the idea of hypertensional metaphysics. Then it, you have to conclude that in hypertensional metaphysics, maybe maybe not objective, which and not maybe be, be metaphysics, I don't know. So this is a very unstable position. Uh, I don't have an up argument, but I think if we can avoid it, we better avoid it. What about opaque objective counterpossibles? Well, it's something that like Berthaud, uh, so uh, Franz Berthaud, Graham Priest, Dave Ripley, and Robert French uh, wrote a paper where they uh, attack Williamson's views on counterpossibles, and they address their argument. I, uh, I, uh, I reported, and they said, "Oh, let's grant that uh, counterpossibles are objective." They don't like claim it, but they say, "Well, we can we can accept that assumption. It's not a, it's, and it's, co it's compatible with uh, with our view of our non vacuumism about counterpossible." And then uh, the question is, "Well." And they accept the intuition about, uh, they also accept the, the example that, uh, that shows that, it's, that counterpossibles are opaque. So they have, to, they, have, they have to say, well, opacity and objectivity are compatible. And then I say, well, how? And they say a few things in defense of that, because they, they, have, they have to say something. So the first thing they say is that because they have impossible worlds, uh, they can account for that. And they're in a sense in which impossible worlds allow you to show how uh, objectivity and, and uh, opacity are compatible. And I will, and I will reconstruct that argument, which is like not very, which needs to be unpacked from the literature. But it's not, um, uh, uh, ultimately, I will, I will reject their, their proposal. Uh, so, first, they also make a confusion between hypertensionality and opacity. Although it goes in, a, it's done in, in the like it's a symmetrical confusion. So they they make the right observation that an operator of context being hyperintentional simply does not imply it's being representational or deistic. So that they, they get right, and they they, they point to hyperintentional contexts that are not in any way about representational features and counterfactual may be well among these. So we can have uh, hyperintentionality uh, without appeal to uh, representation. And so they, and while saying that, they think they are safe because they think that they have secure hyperintentionality from opacity. But wait, they accepted an example that also establishes an independent opacity. So this this has no weight on the issue. Um, so uh, hyperintentionality does not uh, attain opacity. Okay, but then uh, the existence of Objective hyperintentionality does not entail the existence of objective opacity. So, okay, it's, it's a good observation, I agree, but uh, it doesn't solve anything to the issue. And then, so they have impossible worlds, and they have uh, not any kind of impossible worlds, they have like very, um, um, how should I put it so that it's not brought with negative connotation? Logic, logically chaotic, impossible worlds. But that's why the people who like them like them, so it's not supposed to be negative. Um, so you have two levels of like uh, chaoticity. 
The first one is that for every formula, you have a world where it's uh, true. So even like a contradiction will be true uh, everywhere. But also for every set of formula, uh, there is a world. For every set of formulas, n and formula, there is a world where all the formulas, all the members of gamma are true. And phi is not true. Which means that for any logical law you could possibly imagine, there is a possible world. There is a, there is a world, impossible in that case, in many cases, which uh, falsifies, which uh, invalidates that law. Uh, we know that there are very weird worlds around. Uh, and so, in particular, so this is the primary directive and this is the secondary directive. And so, by the secondary directive, uh, for every identity statement between which they designators, the identity, and every sentence B, C, we will find a word where A equals B is true, uh, C filled with A is true, and C filled with B is false. And it will serve that also in cases where C is objective. Because, well, it's an impossible world in that case. So here's what they say. A world is partially characterized by a set of sentences. This tells exactly what the world is like, whether it's possible or impossible. And if it be retorted that if A uh, equals B and this statement really is about A and B, the failure of substitutivity would be impossible. And the reply is, of course, it's impossible, of course, but we are in an impossible world. So what's the problem? And so they are right to say that there is a sense in which objectivity is compatible with opacity, that is, at impossible worlds. At impossible worlds, you can have both. But then, hey, you've accepted that this is true and this is false in the actual world. So if your, your response to the, to the fact that uh, if you say, well, uh, opacity is compatible with, uh, with objectivity at impossible worlds, then you have to say that the actual world is an impossible world. Because here you have a failure of the substitutivity of identity. So uh, there is just no way <coughs> to save the coexistence of compatibility of objectivity and opacity in the actual world. So there is no way to save it for uh, the evaluation of those two counterpossibles in the uh, in the actual world. So basically, their their proposal is that is uh, is incoherent because they cannot accept that the actual world is an impossible world. Um, so. I conclude that Berto, uh, Ripley, Priest, and uh, French fail to make coherent sense of objective opacity. So what do we do if we want to resist uh, Williamson's argument? And here's my plea for transparency. So I think the, re the, re the, the reform should be more transparent. How, how, how much time do I have? Maybe I'm already over. Yeah, I have 15 minutes over before ah. I interrupted you. Uh, um, so, OK, to I'll try to. Uh, to wrap it up in, um, I try to give the general idea and then we can discuss the details in the Q&A. Uh, so, at the end of the day, the problem comes from this isolated intuition. So we have general argument from non vacuumism to hypertensionality, but the only connection between counterpossible non vacuumism and opacity comes from intuitions. Should we trust those intuitions? So I said at the beginning that intuitions are as good as the unavailability of an uh, independent error theory. Do we have an independent error theory? And I say I think we do, actually. Uh, we do because uh, Saul Kripke, who, uh, the late Saul Kripke, who died a few days ago, unfortunately, actually uh, developed a whole theory about model illusions. Uh, and especially uh, when it comes to the use of proper names, which are rigid designators. And all the intuitions have in the background the necessity of identity, so they are all connected to uh, like these Kripkean considerations. So what Kripke told us is that it's easy to confuse an impossible world where Hesperus is not phosphorus with a possible world where, which is just like ours, except that 
you have a star which shines exactly the way Shabbat Venus shines in our sky in the morning, and, it's, and there's another planet that shines uh, in the evening exactly in the way that uh, Venus shines in the evening, but they are two distinct stars. And so from a, like a purely epistemic perspective, those two worlds look exactly the same. Uh, the second one is definitely possible, and people will behave linguistically in exactly the same way. They will go the first one Hesperus and go the second one Hesperus. But only the second one is a possible world. And when we say Hesperus is not Hesperus, uh, we, we literally say that one thing, <laughs> Venus, is not Venus. So it's impossible. And, but sometimes people might say, well, it could have been that. Babylonian discovered that Hesperus is Hesperus, but you know, could have been that uh, actually there were two different planets. Well, if you say so, you, if you, if you, the only way to make sense of this is to say that you use an epistemic uh, good, but if you uh, want to use an objective good, there's no way this can be true. And you can easily confuse the two. And so the proposal is to say, well, um, those, I will go directly to the so, so my proposal is that the, the, the intuitions that uh, tend to establish that uh, counterfact counterpossibles are opaque are exactly the same kinds of, intu of intuitions. So they are plausible if you rephrase them uh, either epistemically or with a kind of story when you have to do two distinct plans. Here they work, but if you take seriously the fact that uh, Hesperus and Phosphorus just uh, name the same planet, then uh, what you have to say is that this is false, just in the same way that this is false, because this counterfactual supposition is exactly the same as, as this counterfactual supposition. And just to finish with a with a uh, an anomaly point against Ramprist, but I think it's a fair it's a fair point. Because in his in his book on um, on uh, non classical logics, <coughs> he addresses the problem of uh, substitutivity identity in the context of relevant logics, and he says, well, uh, you get this. So if A equals B, then A equals B entails B equals B, and it seems to violate the requirement of relevance because those two against them, the consequent don't share anything. Uh, but then it says, well, because A is equal to B, then they say exactly the same thing, basically that uh, um, both the same object is, uh, is uh, identical to itself. So if, you, if you're allowed to make that move in the context of relevance, it seems weird to deny that move in the case of counterfactuals. Um, so, uh, so perhaps... Uh, it looks like uh, if you apply this kind of standard, if you have these kind of standards, uh, when it comes to relevant application, you should apply them to counterfactuals and then you will get that evaluation. Um, uh, I have. So, what I propose is to take what possible to be no more representational than ordinary counterfactuals. I think the view is theoretically elegant. That is more than a view that says that some are some, like quantum possibles are representational and most quantum factuals are uh, objective, and it serves the needs for hypothetical metaphysics. So I think the Party of Reform only needs to adopt a stronger policy in favor of transparency to resist Williamson's argument. And I thank you for your attention. Or do you want us to take uh, some more break? Anybody? Five minutes? Mm, no specific demanders for break. Then we cut in with the questions immediately. Thanks. Uh, maybe I, I miss it, but mm -hmm. do you see just a, a structural similarity between your case about fictionalism and hyperintentionality, or do you see something more deeper there? Um, no, I think the... Uh, so... I 
I think all those issues are are are, are connected, but the, uh, the the connection is deeper in the case of hyperintentional metaphysics. Um, but so in the case of fictionalism, so one way people uh, argue in favor of uh, non vacuous uh, or motivate non vacuous counter possibles is to say sometimes we need to be able to take the perspective of a theory we know is impossible just to reason about it. Uh, so fictionalism is an instance of that, but it's not the only reason or the only uh, instance where you can do that. Just for example, people say, well, sometimes we are uh, we are given like uh, examples of very weird metaphysical theories or very weird logical theories. We kind of believe that they are uh, impossible. And if you are right, they, they are impossible. But still, there should be non-trivial reasoning we can make with them. And to do that, we would need uh, non-vacuous uh, counter possibles. Uh, it does not uh, require uh, hyperintentional uh, metaphysics. So even if there were, if there were no uh, hyperintentional metaphysics involved, you could still want uh, to be a fictionalist and to use counterpossibles to play in fictionalism uh, with uh, non-contingent, non-contingently false uh, metaphysical fictions. So in that sense, the motivation from fictionalism is uh, is more general. You don't need to buy metaphysical hyperintentionalism. But it's still to be open to, to the idea of reasoning hyper-intentionally about metaphysics, about false metaphysical theories that are impossible. So the, 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 the hyper-intentionality hyper will be only in the logic, whereas uh, if you go with the hyper-intentional metaphysics, the hyper-intentionality is, is already in the concepts that you use to describe the world. So, so the... Um, the motivations are, are not exactly at the same level, and it's true that the way I constructed the, the later argument, the one that matters most is the second one, the connection with hyperintentional metaphysics. But I think it's also, also fair to, Williamson mentions the, the one with fictionalism, and I think it's, a, it's also good if you can, uh, if, can, if non-vacuous counterpossibles can help you be a fictionalist, I think it's, it's a good application, but it was not the central one I, I had in mind, so perhaps I could have made that more clear in the, here in the, in the presentation. Does that answer your question? No, not really. Yes, but partly because, yes, you're right that there's some similarity in some cases of fictionalism or special cases of hyperintentional in certain cases in, in the context. But of course, when we go to fictionalism, it's not the same motivation at all. Okay? When you go to it's the preservation of truth that you really, really care about about fictionalism. You worry that the thing you include in the in the tools will get you to something. When you you get rid of the fiction, yeah. then you get to the conclusion mm -hmm. that you, there will be some effect of the tool in the result. And hopefully, even if it's a problematic tool, you would like to have no effect in the some kind of conservativeness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and it seems to me that hyperintentionality is much, much broader, much more metaphysical, like you said. So, but, but they, they are structurally the same. So you want to have non-vacuism in both of them. Yes, exactly. But for a completely different reason. Yeah. So that's why I'm surprised that, that, that Williamson is saying that they are both in the same category, at least for, for his arguments. No, 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 no. okay, so... Um, or there are two cases. So it's two different. So there are two different motivations, and you could, in principle, have one motivation without having the other. But they are both related to metaphysics. Yeah. Okay. So if you have a fictionalized program into metaphysics, you should like uh, non vacuous counterpossibles. If you have a program in hypertension metaphysics, but you are not a fictionalist, then you should like. Uh, so the two are independent. Perhaps it could be combined. I, but, I don't know you, of any you, way to combine them. You could be a fictionalist that wants to have non-vacuism because obviously it would be very bad for fiction. Yeah, exactly. And you don't care about metaphysics. Exactly, at all. exactly, exactly. Which is maybe not the it's less the case for our hyper intentionality. There seems to have 
ontological consequence immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Charles. Yeah, so I, I have a weird a weird question, but, but maybe it will help me explore your position a little more, give you yeah. some more time to rant okay. about your position as well. Because I was super happy to see you come back to the intuition question at the end about how to unpack these things. Because one thing that struck me at least, I'm, I'm struggling with how to formulate this. One that struck me as weird, right, about our intuitions in those kinds of cases is that it strikes me that I don't really have intuitions directly about evaluating the counter possible. What I have is intuitions about evaluating a kind of sense of which maybe some of those happen to invoke counter possibles. But for instance, if Hobbes had squared the circle, the kids in South America wouldn't have cared. If Hobbes had gone to the bathroom at 4.30 in the afternoon on a Tuesday, the kids in South America wouldn't have cared either. There's something at a much broader level. I'm not really engaging the counterpossibleness of the squaring the circle when I create my intuition that the kids in South America wouldn't have cared. It's just about like the fact that they don't care about what Hobbes is up to. Um, Hesperus and Phosphorus, you can play the same, you can, you can get, it's a little bit more complicated to play the same kind of game, but I feel like you probably still can, and this is where, I think maybe you were doing something that looked kind of like this at the end, right? Mm -hmm. Where like, it's not, the intuition that the astronom astronomical facts would have to be different is more like, but I know like how people put names on stuff when they, when they assign, when they like do astronomy. So like, if we had decided to put names on stuff differently, probably that means that the stuff would have been different in like a relevant way. Um, and it's like as a specification of that general principle that I have, if I have that intuition, that I have that vague intuition that like, that like that counter possible kind of makes sense. But it strikes me like none of those, in no cases am I playing with, am I, do I really feel like, yes, I'm like sitting with the counter possible and I feel just like that counter possible sentence just feels correct. And so I wonder if there's if there's something interesting or deep about that about what I just said, or if that's like kind of orthogonal and sideways. No, no, it's uh, it's completely so. It's typically the kind of line that uh, the or the orthodox uh, philosophers, the way they try to diffuse those intuitions. So okay. uh, either we use some some heuristic, we neglect the fact that we kind of like. Uh, we neglect the, the modal status of the antecedent and we just like look with their connection, like a reasonable connection, if no, not. Um, so the the problem, so what is problematic about those intuitions is that, so it's, it's in the case of falsity, because everyone agrees about the case of truth. So the, so the question is what happens when you say that it is false? Because usually when you deny a, a, a conditional, because you kind of accept or you're, you're allowed the antecedent, but you want to deny the consequence. So, mm. uh, so it seems that you prepare to you prepare to accept like the eventuality. So I, I do not use the term possibility. Right? You prepare to have the eventuality of like having the antecedent without the consequent. And in the case of Hobbes, uh, I mean, of course you have to you have to know that uh, it's mathematically impossible. But basically, so the trade-off is well. It's impossible, but yeah. So one one like one pressure is like it's impossible, so anything goes. But here, like uh, the thing is like completely. You, there seems to be no connection, so uh, I should be able to uh, to have one without the other. I mean, each principle, very possibility. Like uh, if you are if you are flexible enough to allow for. Uh, like local impossibilities to happen. Like, I don't know if, the, if 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 God had made the laws of math a bit different, and if perhaps, and or if logic has been like had worked a bit differently, maybe you know, uh, it's not about like God being wrong about the incompleteness theorems, but if like God had created formal systems in a different way, uh, yeah, and Derrida. So, um, so, but yes, so I agree that the, so this game is a bit cheap uh, in, the, in the sense that uh, the kind of thing that fuels intuitions is more like the children do not care about math. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Derrida has nothing to do with the Gödel's theorem or whatever. So, so th this is kind of like a, so this is this is the trick that's supposed to get you into the intuition. Uh, so then the, the question is like if we if we if we trust our intuition in those cases to be like considered intuition, like there's this trade-off questions. Do we like is the impossibility sufficiently like uh, uh, weird or blatant so that it blocks everything? So just like there's there's no comparison whatsoever with anything else, so that the issue of like the relevance of the consequence is completely. Uh, completely uh, out of the question or we can still make connections and if you can still make connections there is a sense for non vacuous falsity so one example that uh, is used by people uh, from the um, uh, from the Berto uh, priest camp So if you reason from it rains, and it doesn't rain right now, so if it were to rain and not rain right now, it would, st it would still rain. It's a counter possible. But here, you just apply conjunction elimination. And, sorry. But the reason why you accept this has nothing to do with, the, with why you would accept this, just because, well, if it rains, if it were to rain and not rain, then the Pope is a Pope is a whatever. The Pope is must be. Um, those like the way you get to those judgments seems to be like uh, quite different. So, um, so I agree with the. So I think your observation about the like what drives our intuition is, is is completely correct. But if we trust, so this could have, like this could be used as an argument to. To uh, diffuse some of those intuitions, if, if like, for example, if if, if, I, if I were reading an XPy um, next XPy paper and where people did not like apply like control for the comprehension of the subjects, so that uh, mm -hmm. you just like see that it's about math and uh, and they, then I would say it's very poor uh, evidence for the intuition in case of like, uh, falsity. But uh, if we trust the I mean, there's a way. To, I think there's a way to, and I can elaborate. I can take you to the to the to a, a, um, a justification for those judgments that clearly uh, takes into account the possibility of uh, the antecedent and balances off with the relevance of the of the consequence. I would like to uh, react on yeah. this. I, I would say that it's even the same sort of, situa sort of situation you get for most uh, counterfactuals. Uh, people use whatever principle they have that doesn't have to do with the, the specific thing you change to still make it go through. So uh, had you not been here, uh, then uh, it wouldn't have been able to uh, cast on YouTube. Uh, yeah, maybe that's not a good example. Well, <coughs> so, so the fact that this goes through is because of there's a simple link between your presence and our abil ability to cast on YouTube, um, independent from the fact that you're uh, in fact not here or where you are. So it's like it's always a matter of ignoring some substantial things and see what goes through anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so for me at least, uh, I'm a very counter, counter possibilist. Uh, that, that doesn't cause any problems, the fact that there's some possible stuff you're going to ignore. It's always about ignoring yeah. stuff. Sure, not sure. Not, not that I think of it, I think there's, a, there's something cheap about some of the examples, maybe not all of them, but at least some of them. 
So if you just take a true counterpassable, which is true just because the, the consequence is irrelevant, and then you get to a false one just by negating, negating the, um, the irrelevant uh, consequence, I think it's a bit cheap uh, because uh, it's not really a case where you say, oh, I could have the antecedent and not have the... I mean, you, of course, you cannot, you cannot have the consequence because you, you chose something which is really, uh, really uh, irrelevant. I think those cases are really important. It's, it's also important to have these kind of cases where um, uh, there's a possibility for, for, the, for the antecedent to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be directly relevant in the true case. Um, yeah. well, I hope it helps. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, so, so I have a question on either of them or naive or both. Uh, this discussion on opacity reminds me a lot of uh, debates I'm more familiar with, which is on symmetries in the physics. Okay. And uh, the, the idea that um, this uh, opacity introduces uh, some kind of uh, Class of equivalence lessons in possible world. It seems to me the same as in the you have symmetries that uh, create a class of equivalence of uh, possible world in physics, and uh, the, uh, the traditional uh, way to see it in, in your case and in uh, symmetry both is uh, that uh, the invariance is the objective way to see stuff, and it's what is metaphysically pertinent to what is invariant, what is objective. Mm, I see. And I was wondering if. Uh, in the same way that I'm trying to define that the perspectives that are being introduced by symmetries are objective part of the world metaphysically pertinent. I was wondering if you could say that the opa opacity is in the metaphysics and it's objectively, it's, it's objective opacity in the sense that it's uh, in the real world, it's, there is a real uh, opacity in the world and that the uh, way the representational stuff is uh, pertinent metaphysically and you cannot get rid of it in a Husserlian way or something like that. Uh, thanks, thanks, that's a very... Uh that's a very, uh, very good, um, um, very so it's a very good question. So, um, so it's true that uh, so there's a sense in which uh, the way the argument, both the way Williamson does his argument and the way also I, I run the argument and I twist it around, uh, goes from like. Because it's almost by definition impossible to have both objectivity and opacity, because you take uh, referential transparency as a, as a criterion of, of opacity. So uh, there's a sense in which it, it's um, it's uh, it's almost a definitional claim, and I agree with you that we should be open to the possible. I mean, why 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 couldn't we have like perspectives within metaphysics? I mean, what? I think we should be. A, there should be a way to to rule this out. I mean, it would be better to have a way to rule this out, which is uh, not just by definition, but from more like a substantive reasoning. Uh, so that's why I. So the way I tr the best thing I can offer uh, for that is to justify the criterion of uh, transparency. Uh, and not just take it as a, just a definition. And I think there's a, that, 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 so I'm just repeating myself, so if, if you think that something is, is really about an entity and, not, and independently of any perspective, then uh, it should be transparent. And if the substitutivity of identical fails, it means that uh, you have um, some perspective involved. And you are out of objectivity. So then I think the, 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 the way to move in is to perhaps try to, uh, to focus more on what we mean identity. So the thing is whether we have people believe when something is true. And B. And the idea is that like C is about A and nothing else. And for now, I, 
I can hardly do anything more than just say about, <laughs> which is a bad sign if you're in the field when you when just like feel like you're not, you need to insist like that. And uh, but the key notion is like I think that's where the action is. So part of the action is there. Um, and it's about this and independently and non-perspectively. I mean, <coughs> so it's about. But of course, when you have like uh, something. When you use a particular mode of description, it's still about, but it's independently of uh, a mode of presentation. Uh, and the idea is that the mode of presentation is something that is outside, let's say. It's in the world, it's in, a, it's in the mind, sorry, it's in the mind. Of it. so it's the way we present stuff, and so. That's why uh, sensitivity to mode of presentation takes us out from objectivity. Uh, then I think one way to, to move forward is to question this notion of mode of presentation. Uh, is there anything to say about objective? Are there objective modes of presentation? Um, and so, so, so in literature, so there's there's literature of representational grounding, and where I think you have this kind of issues. So Korea, for example, uh, you easily have com have problems when you, when you so you, if you accept the thesis that water is H2O, but you also um, accept the thesis that. Uh, Something about H2O, I don't know what, something about structure of H2O um, grounds something about water. Uh, well, if, if let's, let's, I cannot think right away about the predicate. That would be possible that would equally apply to water and H2O, but suppose we have something like that. If we uh, if you accept the identity claim, if we take it seriously as an identity claim, and we accept that grounding is irreflexive, nothing grounds itself, then we cannot accept this. We cannot say that something about H2O grounds something about water. Because well, this is exactly the same thing. So it would be like, it would be exactly like accepting phi H two O grounds phi H two O. And yet, some people have said that there are some like uh, descriptions which are metaphysically more accurate or cut nature at the joints more than others. Uh, and so, one way to to make sense of this claim. In spite of this, and in spite of this, is to say that uh, this, is, this description is more joint carving than this one. Then the problem is that joint carvingness will be referentially opaque. Maybe logicians should do more philosophy of science. I mean, real philosophy of science, you know, about uh, real representation. No, of course you can deny that. You can deny. You can start with denying that. No, but but it's weird, you know, a mode of representation of presentation that would be objective, a contextual notion that could be objective in a deep, 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 deep correspondent way with the world, a grounding of representation. You know, it's it's maybe okay, but it sounds real. No, I agree with you. Of science. No, I agree with you. I'm just trying to push the idea as far as I can. Uh, I mean, no, no, no. I, I agree, but but so it's but weird, I, I think you know it's a little bit like the way maybe it's the way you explain it. The Berto, the Berto uh, answer to to the night tree, which is because it works in impossible worlds, it's okay. Uh, okay. Okay, but but how is it related, as you said, 
to any consideration about opacity in the, real in world? the actual world. Yeah, I think that's the that's the problem of their era. Uh, uh, I, uh, I don't want to be to be nasty, but the way you present it, I don't know, I don't know the original literature, but it seems a very dumb. That's why I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm so very embarrassed, but they, they go very quickly in the paper, so I try to be as charitable as I can. Um, it's, it's I, I gave, I mean, basically the, the quote I gave is almost everything they say about it, mm -hmm. which is, well, of course there will be failure of substitutivity, to, substitutivity, substitutivity for objective context in impossible, that's impossible, well, yes, it, ha it happens in impossible worlds. Thanks, thank you. Okay. It doesn't help with the problem, which is uh, you cannot. If you say that counter possibles are objective, and you have an example that shows that they are opaque, uh, you are in the real world. So, the, so moving to impossible worlds does not solve it. But sorry, I, 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 you could continue. Uh -huh. I stop you. No, I think I, I said. Uh, I said. Uh, so perhaps the idea of like uh, description being more or less being more fundamental or more joint carving, so in the cyber sense, mm -hmm. can get you, can put some, it's a way to put perspective back into metaphysics. Uh, the immediate issue, uh, and it's something uh, perhaps needs to think more about, is that this will help, like, tempor temporarily seems to solve the problem, but only to get the, the result that joint carvingness will be not an objective. Uh, so, um, so there is a sense in which you, if you start to do the, the metaphysics of joint carvingness, like metaphysics, automatically loses some sort of objectivity. So, so perhaps, so the thing that joint carvingness is, or you have the same problem about what are the consequences of hyperintentionality for opacity. I think. Going joint carvingness, you will all, you will have to live with hyperintentionality because you will already have like a logically uh, equivalent descriptions which bring like uh, irrelevant stuff uh, that will be non-joint carving. So we have to make discriminations about things that live in this exactly the same possible worlds. So so it will take you directly to hyperintentionality, and that is okay. Uh, we're doing hyperintentionality. But if it, if it takes you to opacity, so I, I think in this specific case, I would, I would put the pressure on this kind of view. Uh, to be honest, I, I think that the tricky like, justification for this in, in the Navy and is, I mean, it's uncontrollable that it's super sketchy. Um, I, think, I, I think still, uh, even in the, the philosophy of science, really, like, Criticize me if I say something crazy, but it seems like the idea of theoretical identification is still like something like uh, reasonable. So the idea that we can like put an identity side between like theoretical concepts, maybe not whatever, but other stuff, you know, is something that we might need at some point in the field of science. So, and if the, if so, then we might have issues of capacity when we deal with theoretical identification. I, mean, I think so. Uh, there's a, I think, what I took to be a good book by a guy called Rafael Van Riel about reduction. Yeah. Uh, he, he points out that uh, uh, intertheoretical reduction brings a high intentionality because you have issues of, uh, of irreflexivity and, uh, and non-commutativity. So obviously it has to be hyperintentional. But then when we talk about the reducibility of theoretical talk to others, we're in the representation of the world. We're not doing like metaphysics. So uh, we're not ident we, we yeah, we, we so so if it's opaque it's not a problem in that case. Yeah, from from about some point of science, uh, this uh, op opacity of joint carriedness, you could say that you have multiple theories that describe the exact same thing, but the way to get out of it I, I would suppose is to believe of uh, some kind of principle of fundamentality that the only fundamental one is joint carrying. In this case, carrying with uh, at the joint of the world, but yeah. Maybe if you have non, if you don't have reduction in a strong sense, then uh, you just back into the opacity and this, this is such a problem. I, I don't know, I would say that if I write the book of the world as Cider wants to, to write it and pick every 
have names that are perfect names and the predicates that are perfect. Everything is called the joint. I would definitely not have distinct names for the same entities. So the issue of, uh, of opacity will never occur. And if it were to occur, uh, I would say I would, I would throw the book away and start writing again because I would not expect the, but, like, any, but anything but in the book of the world to be opaque. But in the book of the world, there should only be fundamental entities. Named. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you have to presume that there is yeah. fundamentality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is which is a strong case. Fundamentality and reduction because it's something like a card, right? You have levels of. Oh stuff, yeah, so yeah. Fundamentality plus behavior reduction to fundamental entities. So okay. I mean. But if it's turtles all the way down. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> Maybe turtles all the, all the way down. <laughs> Maybe in case, in this case, you're not writing a book of the world, but uh, you have to you have to assume something when you start doing yeah. writing a book. You know. Well, you assume that the world is not uh, uniform and it's this but it in a way that way that's right would say. But yeah, yeah, yeah sure. No, I'm yeah, you're right. It should be explicit that they are talking about. I'm, I'm just trying some fundamental. Because for grounding, you don't need necessarily fundamentality. For of course, ah, you do, you do, because the ground, the ground is supposed to be more fundam fundamental than the grounding, so it's a kind of... Uh, no, no, but you, when I say fundamentality, it's you need a level zero. Yeah, you need a... Uh, it cannot be turtle all the way. Yeah, around. sure. Uh, okay. But the level zero is a strong claim about the world. No, of course, of course, I agree. For, uh, I was talking about relative fundamentality here. Okay, that's... Uh, which I take to be, uh, of course, you might deny that, but I, I, I thought that in mainstream metaphysics of science, like the concept of relative fundamentalities, something. Okay, like but that. when you talk about the book of the world, and you can write every, no, that it's described by every sentence that that is pointing to every object, it's it's like a wisdom mosaic of the world. Yeah, sure. You need a, fun, a zero level, and you need a language that is unique. For this natural okay, property okay, that other people do. Fair enough. So that, fair that's enough. cool. That's okay. Fair if, if, if all this discussion depends on this claim, I would, metaphysical claim, I, I'm okay. It's just okay. No, no, I was trying to relate to to help like Kevin to relate to parts of the literature where like a clear metaphysical program where it's built in terms of joint pairingness and cyber comes to mind. Mm. No, no, but I uh, agree. And uh, yeah, of course, there are assumptions that you might deny. So. But but I what I what I would say is that maybe Williamson's and all these guys, they have this metaphysical claim in the background to, to shape their, their discussion. That's a good question. Um, At least not to exclude certain. Yeah. The way they write about these particular issues, uh, they, they tend to not bring uh, any specific metaphysical, uh, the, w the world may be uh, like a stroke, may be layered, may not be layered. They are quite I inimical to that, so they tend to see, to, to not like the idea of like uh, facts uh, that are hyper intentionally individuated. So they're kind of in inimical to uh, hyper intentionally individuated metaphysical entities. But uh, yeah, it's hard to say mo anything more specific on that. Questions, but uh, we don't have much time anymore. But uh, my so I I, I, I like I very much like your talk, and, and I think I agree with the criticism you had uh, to these uh, um, heterodoxists. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't really get your solution or how how you got out of uh, okay. Yeah. So the that's true. Williams. Uh, yeah. The the. Um, Deny from two. So the strategies that, that in all the papers I've read and people either attack one or attack three. Yeah. But the one attacks two because attacking two means uh, rejecting the intuition. One of the intuitions for non vacuum the one about his person for So Morgan and Salerno accept that intuition. All the, mo I mean, all the, maybe not all of them, but all I've read explicitly endorse the intuition about Hesperson Phosphorus. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. So, uh, 
and they treat it exactly in the same way as the others. The fact that it's the only one that has to deal with the substitutivity of identicals, I think is, is an independent grounds to, to take it apart. So it's not me being, being doing cherry picking. It's like this is a different kind of different game being played here because the logical structure of the of the case is different. And the second reason why I'm not cherry picking is that uh, we have independent in the case of models, objective models, we have a story why uh, the use of uh, uh, S-person phosphorus can lead us astray. And my proposal is that uh, like uh, the same story or very, just a bit more complicated because uh, you, have, you have some details to take care of. Uh, but very similar story is helpful to show how the intuition that is responsible for two actually is not a, it's not a safe intuition. It's ambiguous, you have scope distinctions, there are different ways to understand uh, 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 how it works, especially if you, if, you, if, you, if you take this as rigid designators and you neutralize the descriptive content. I mean, if you compare the, the rigid designators, the equivalent or the, 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 sim, the rephrasal in terms of descriptions, uh, because you have like two definite descriptions connected by an equal sign, you have four possible ways of assigning scope. So, but I think you can isolate the reading which gives you the intuition. Uh, which is this one. So there is, there are two entities. I'll see there's one entity which S provides and does not phosphorize. Uh, or uh, so they could have been like a, uh, like a, a planet who just appears in the morning and does not appear in the morning. And if had, that had been the case, what I was talking about would have been wrong. But uh, what could not have, I mean, one thing that could not have happened for non astronomical reasons, but like a deeper metaphysical reason is if something had both has provided and not has provided, then we have it. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why we just say no, it cannot be the case. But here, uh, we're dealing with uh, definite descriptions. Uh, just in the same way that when we say, oh, it could have been the case that Hesperus is not phosphorus, no, it could have been the case that something phosphorizes and, and not Hesperizes. Hesperizes is, is a shorthand for the description that appears exactly in the same place. So that's what intuition is about according to me, so that's what I, what I claim. Mm -hmm. And Kripke uh, has a story about why we can easy t easily, easily take that as the same as uh, the same claims with Hesperus in, in the place of Hesperizes and Phosphorus in the place of Phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And so the pressure, given that the Kripke is mainstream, so the dialectical move, so to speak, I mean, uh, is that if you accept quick history about models, and almost everyone accepts it, then you should accept it here too. And the fact that people use these kinds of examples, which are very tricky, and because they, if you want to make it as a case of uh, hyperintentionality and not just opacity, you have to assume the necessity of the identity, which means yeah, you have to assume the quick story about the proper names. So if you want to assume, like assume it all the way down. Yeah. And so and so that story is at least very coherent. I mean I'm sure that follows logically from Kripke. I mean you have some interpretation, but all the like the way I run the story I think is, is very uh, uh, very uh, true or like to the to the, 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 the Kripkean view so uh, it should be yeah. like the Kripkeans should agree with that. At least we prepare to say that it's coherent, at least. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and do you, like this, this, this uh, referential opacity, um, I think you only gave examples where it's the, it's the reference of names uh, uh, for objects, uh, but, but it's also supposed to hold for properties and full aspects of language. 
it's their reference to be well even the counter the counter possibilities yes so um, that's a good uh, question so and not opaque so transparent I, I think it's a uh, it's it's a more complicated so it's I think it's relatively uncontroversial that we refer to individuals by means of names. Mm -hmm. The question is how we refer to properties mm -hmm. when we do, if we ever do. Uh, what I think is like, what I'm not, not prepared to accept easily, although I need to, to look at the literature in more details, is whether just predicating a property to an object counts as referring to it. I wouldn't say so, but it depends on your theory of predication. So, for example, uh, so if you had like a principle that said that allowed you to move from this to that, yeah, which is, I mean, it, it might be a reasonable principle. It's a substitutivity principle that makes sense. I don't know if I would call it. So, if this fails. Uh, I'm not sure I would relate that to the phenomenon of referential opacity because I'm not sure it has to do with reference. But still, it's a it's a it's a kind of opacity in the sense that you treat like identical stuff differently. Um, there are referential terms, no? I mean, I mean, it really depends how what what you make of this this symbol. Yeah. Um, and then. Basically, you're going into higher order logic, yes. and and uh, I, I have to say I'm not a, not an expert in this area. Uh, all I know is that things get really more complicated, and you, you have trouble with paradoxes mm -hmm. uh, very quickly. So it requires a lot of care. At the moment, I am not in a position to say anything about this, but uh, from the purely philosophical uh, point of view. If you think that uh, counter possibles are objective, and you believe that uh, it makes sense to, talk, to identify uh, properties that are presented in, in different ways, uh, then I think these kind of principles should hold for counter, counter possibles and counterfactuals generally. Uh, and that, that's kind of that's the same like philosophically. That's what follows from uh, the view I, I try to sketch. But I, I don't see like reasons where this kind of principle would be problematic independently of the way this person was first problematic. So, but if you can find something, uh, I'd be very interested to see uh, what I should say about them. Thanks a lot. Uh, we should finish here already five minutes out of time. <laughs>